I've taken the time to study the all 22 coaches film from the Buffalo Bills preseason win over the Steelers, and I'm sharing my top takeaways today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Well, folks, welcome in. Time to break down the all 22 film that I had a chance to study on Sunday. And I'm here to share with you my top observations from reviewing the film. I want to start with defense because I think that's where the most fun stuff is to discuss. Then we'll talk offense. We'll get to studs and duds and have a good time here on a Monday. So let's talk defense. And we've got to start with the story of the game, Joe Andreessen. And you watch the game live, and you certainly saw him make a ton of plays. And so I was very excited to watch the tape and really get a feel for how and why he was able to make so many plays. And I would say, based on this exposure, which is really my first extended exposure to Joe Andreessen, you know, he played 44 snaps. And so I was able to look at all these snaps. And I would say that Andreessen is a very instinctive, and physical football player. His ability to process, trigger, and play with confidence really, really popped. And he's extremely physical, and his ability to play off contact was highly impressive to me. I mean, he is stacking and shedding offensive linemen, bench pressing James Daniel back into the gap, disengaging and making play after play after play. Fast to flow, physical, good contact balance, and just getting to the football. Obviously, he's a terrific athlete, and he plays with a hot motor. It's a really nice combination. I thought he flashed in coverage as well. Not that the Steelers give you the best measuring stick for coverage, because I don't think Russell Wilson or Justin Fields play the the position particularly well, and that they are going to, you know, diagnose, hit their back foot, deliver the football with consistency, right? They're very visual players and um, don't give you necessarily the greatest measuring stick. But I thought that he flashed in coverage, had a very nice man coverage rep against Pat Fryermuth, where he was able to carry him vertical, take him off the menu, wound up being a sack on the play by Greg Rousseau. Another instance in man coverage where he was responsible for the back and they ran this play action screen and Andreessen was able to play right off the block of James Daniels and tackle that running back just as he was able to catch the football for maybe a a tackle for loss, maybe a no gain, something like that. So a couple of good man coverage reps. You could tell that the zone coverage was fine. I wouldn't say it was overly good. Um, Was able to kind of spot drop and get to his landmarks. There were a couple of instances where somebody kind of got between the second and third levels and you're not sure if it was Dorian and you're not sure if it was Joe Andreessen, but maybe a few times where there wasn't enough depth in the drop and they were able to kind of uncover between zones. But overall, I came away watching that game live and being impressed with Joe Andreessen. I came away from studying the film more impressed because you learn how and why he was able to make these plays. And you see football IQ, physicality, contact balance, the ability to play off contact and shed blocks and finish. I mean, it was it was 
completely validated. And so where do we go from here, right? That's the fun part. And I'll spend some time thinking about that this week. Surely he's going to get a ton of opportunity against Carolina on Saturday. But Joe Andreessen just meeting this moment in the biggest imaginable way. Good for him. I think we're all rooting for him. And we'll be excited to kind of see how things evolve this week. What opportunities does he get in practice? What opportunities there are there for him against Carolina? Now, we were supposed to come out of this game talking all about Dorian Williams and how he played. You know, Matt Milano, extended time lost with this injury, the biceps injury. Maybe he comes back in December, maybe not. And so all eyes on Dorian Williams. And Joe Andreessen obviously overshadows anything that happened on the defense. But Dorian Williams played well. He he did he did well for himself. Um, obviously, any time that he plays, you can appreciate fast physical urgency, right? Like he plays hard and he plays physical. And he's a good athlete. And I thought he continues to showcase himself well downhill. I would say that as we've continued to discuss, the concerns with Dorian Williams really stem from coverage. I don't think that this game revealed any real issues with him in coverage. Again, I don't think it was the greatest game to expose issues in coverage either, but I thought he played very well downhill, and I think he was fine in coverage. I thought it was a good overall performance for Dorian Williams, which is obviously overshadowed by the exceptional performance of Joe Andreessen. I want to talk about Daquan Hardy next. I am so impressed with Daquan Hardy, the corner. And he's playing outside corner, and I continue to just be fascinated by this because he's a slot-only player at Penn State. That's 5'9 and 3 8 180 pounds with 30-inch arms and 8 and an eighth inch hands. Not typically what we're talking about as an outside zone corner, but Daquan Hardy is meeting this moment was targeted six times in coverage against the Steelers, allowed two catches for 13 yards, had two pass breakups. Both the completions that he allowed were little quick short gains in two-minute situations where Daquan Hardy was happy to allow a catch and then force the guy out of bounds or make a tackle. The route where he carried George Pickens down the field vertical was awesome, the one that Mike Tomlin challenged. He was calm. You know, he's going one-on-one -on -one with George Pickens, who's a big-bodied receiver that excels down the field. He's one-on-one -on -one with him. And George Pickens kind of has a hezzy step into a, a bit of a fade route. And Daquan Hardy is calm throughout the entire stem of that route, flips his hits, flips his hips, works inside out, leverages the sideline, right? You want to in that type of a situation, you want to use that sideline to your advantage. And I thought Hardy did a good job of leveraging that. And then my favorite part of the rep was when George Pickens gets his head around to find the football. Hardy does as well, but also stays in phase on coverage, quickly gets his eyes back to Pickens and then plays through the hands. And obviously the ball was incomplete, but that was a heck of a rep. Another great rep was in cover three, Daquan Hardy's working from a half turn. And this is not stuff that slot corners do. Playing playing deep third coverage fr from a half turn with eyes in the backfield. It's it's not what he's ever been asked to do in his career. But he's able to get to his landmark, squeezes a vertical route, passes it off. His eyes are in the backfield while doing this, and he's able to drive forward and break up a pass. I mean, just a really instinctive football player that he's a little small, but, but he's a terrific athlete, explosive athlete. And he's showing a lot of versatility in man coverage, in zone coverage. His run defense was terrific, and, and I thought his run defense was terrific last week against the Bears. Doing a very good job of taking on blocks, leveraging the ball back inside, and sometimes even disengaging and making a play. I mean, I'm just very impressed with Daquan Hardy. And the return reps are fascinating as well. Obviously, the punt return component is where he's most likely to make the impact this year. Obviously, extremely aggressive, and some of that makes me nervous. To his credit, he's taking care of the football so far on these punt returns in terms of ball handling. I've had some questions, and I understand the questions about 
Do you think there's a chance that Daquan Hardy's just being told to return the ball no matter what? I would argue that would probably be true if they were kick returns. But on punt returns, there's so much of a decision-making element that I don't think you want to take away from Hardy doing that in the games. And I also think part of the context that we need to acknowledge is that in both games, the punters were booming the ball, right? Like in situations where they probably outkick their coverage. And so it's a reasonable risk to take because you don't really have guys in your face right away. Now the fair catch inside the five yard line, that's, that's pretty indefensible. But I think that it, it particularly against Pittsburgh where Clay Johnson was booming the ball, maybe they were aggressive decisions, but they were aided because maybe Clay Johnson outkicked his coverage and he wanted to try to make them pay. And, and he had the 31 yard return. So We'll see. He's obviously very aggressive. I can appreciate that he's had good ball handling throughout these aggressive returns. All right, there's another rookie defensive player I want to shout out in addition to some usual suspects and then, of course, focus in on the offensive side of the football. Folks, be sure to stick with me. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. Just visit FanDuel.com slash on to download America's number one sports book. All right, folks, let's get to Javon Solomon, Bill's rookie edge rusher out of Troy. And I thought this was a really good all around performance for him. And, and once again, I want to start by highlighting his run defense, which I thought was terrific. And again, not exactly what you're expecting to be discussing with Javon Solomon, who's kind of been tabbed as a designated pass rusher, but it's the run defense that continues to really shine for me. And last week against the Bears, we praised Javon Solomon for making some plays as an unblocked run defender and staying connected and pursuing the football and, and having some good moments. In this game, you saw him set firm edges. And he's playing mostly on the tight end side, so he's you know too in defense of whatever you want to bring up. He is doing this mostly against tight ends as a strong side player. But his ability to stay disciplined, set the edge, maintain outside leverage, and squeeze down shine time and time again. And if you're part of the Locked On Bill subtext community, you got my film notes where you saw me kind of break down like, I don't know, 20 plays or something like that from the defense. And I think two or three of them were showing Javon Solomon squeezing down and setting firm edges and what that led to for other players. So for him to make plays this week, kind of more traditionally, not just unblocked against the run was really impressive. And then I thought his pass rush was, was really better this week than it was last week. Had 12 pass rush snaps, had four pressures in those 12 pass rush snaps, which is really good. And what my favorite thing about watching him rush the passer in this game was his ability to read the set of the offensive tackle. I think that's an underrated ability of a good pass rusher as can you read the set of an offensive tackle and know how to adjust on the fly and attack the set where it's most vulnerable. And so he's working against Broderick Jones and Broderick Jones had a rough day and he wasn't engaging his hands. And so couple of times where Javon Solomon was able to take advantage of that and uh, set up an inside move because he's, you know, opening his hips outside and exposing the B gap. And Javon Solomon was able to take it. Other instances where he was able to clear hands off of him and, and use his flexibility to dip and get under a block and, and come back underneath and create some pressure. But I thought it was a really good all around game for Javon Solomon. Then there was some usual suspects on the defensive side of the football that you would expect to be good, but I wanted to at least highlight them. They played like, I think all of these guys played 11 snaps. Taron Johnson was terrific. Three dynamic tackles in space, click and close ability, being instinctive, showing great technique. You expect these things, but 
let's not let it be normal. Like, let's always enjoy good performances from good players. Greg Rousseau, obviously, he was a killer. I mean, you hear me talk about long arms, heavy hands. That's what he was able to use against Broderick Jones time and time again, just winning with first contact, being able to play with extension and power to just shuck him out of the way and make plays. And then you see that radius that's available to Greg Rousseau as a finisher. Uh, just how much wingspan he has to be able to close and, and get the quarterback down. And so just continue to be more and more excited about Rousseau and what he can get done this year. Ed Oliver was also terrific in this game. Again, like 11 snaps, but he was super disruptive, quick, flexible, powerful. Uh, on his sack, it was a really fun rep against Isaac Siamalu, who's probably Steelers' best offensive lineman and a good overall offensive lineman. But being able to kind of have give him a hezzy step and then break inside, being able to kind of corner a very tight edge and then get get to the quarterback and finish, you know, being able to kind of be slippery off that edge is vintage Ed Oliver. And so I feel good about him being able to kind of pick up where he left off last year. A couple of other defensive notes here. My, those are my major takeaways. I really wanted to focus in on Andreessen, Hardy, Javon Selleman, accentuate that Dorian Williams did play well, even though we're talking about a different linebacker and then just your usual suspects playing extremely well. But a few other, I guess, more random defensive notes. Uh, Deion Jones continues to play well. I, I think he's just been very, very solid. Where he's supposed to be, playing fast, being physical. I like what I see from Deion Jones. And so I'm pretty comfortable with him as a depth player. I hope he makes a team. And I think there might be a world where he's LB3 right now. Well, we'll see. I don't know. We'll see what Joe Andreessen has to say about it. Fun little competition here, Bruin. But I think there might be space on this roster for both those guys. You know, Milano's injured. We'll see what happens with Spectre. We'll see what happens with Moreau. We'll see what happens with Yulo Foscio. I mean, he played in this game, but like, has he practiced enough to really avoid kind of being stashed this year? We'll see. I think there's, I think there's room for Deion Jones and Joe Andreessen on this roster. It's funny how things change very quickly. Kyer Elam, uh, I thought he played well. My favorite play was probably his run fit. Uh, it was a really good edge by Javon Solomon. And Elam was very enthusiastic to play downhill and make a tackle. And I know that there was some tackling concerns with him coming out of Florida. I thought he looked good in that component. And then, I mean, would he give up one catch for five yards? And I thought it was a good risk to kind of break on a ball. I thought he played well. I thought the Sean Williams played well. Reserve defensive tackle. Uh, some good pass rush, blew up a run play in a critical situation. The one thing that I'd point out about Deshaun Williams is that his snaps came late in the game, late in the game. I think, I think, uh, there was some players that I was a little surprised that got snaps quicker than Deshaun Williams. And it could be more about exposures and you're giving different guys, different looks and opportunities. And it wasn't his turn, but, uh, it was like Branson Dean was getting, run much earlier in the game than Deshaun Williams. And that was kind of surprising for me. And then Gable Stevenson played one snap. So, and I don't know if that's because this is a Steelers offense. That's going to challenge you with some dynamic run plays with Justin Fields in the zone read game or whatever, like went into that, but uh, one snap for a developmental player that needs reps. You know, I don't know that that's a, a good sign for him. So that's that's the the defensive notes that I wanted to call to your attention here. Uh, let's spend the entire next segment breaking down offense. We'll talk Keon Coleman, offensive line, some running back notes that I want to get into. Uh, but before we get there, I do want to tell you about an exciting event that I'm going to be part of and, and a new tradition. It's uh, the Day Before Kickoff Festival, the Rally on the River at Buffalo River Works. So the day before the Bills host the Arizona Cardinals. We're going to be having an event here at Buffalo River Works Saturday, September 7th. It's a day full of activities. I'm doing a live podcast as part of the activities at 3 o'clock Eastern time at Buffalo River Works. I'd love for you to come be part of it. Admission is free. There's parking. Um, I'm going on at 3 o'clock. There's live performances from Strictly Hip, which is uh, one heck of a cover band that uh, I've heard about uh, in Western New York. There's going to be Chalk Fest. It's going to be the authentically Western New York theme, and it's unbelievable. They have these grain silos there, and these chalk artists come in and, and 
just draw amazing pictures. I can't wait to see that. Uh, there's amusement rides, kayaking, a zip line, a couple of skating rinks there. They got a couple of, of bars. It's an incredible property. You got to come check it out. Uh, there's going to be a mechanical buffalo, so you can ride the buffalo. You know, you ride the bull, ride the buffalo. Local buffalo vendors, tailgate, food and drink specials. Come be part of it. Again, I go on at 3 o'clock. There's a link in today's show notes. There's a Facebook event page that you can check out with more details, but I'd love for you to be there. I'm excited to come into town for the day and uh, do the live show, but also be part of an amazing event at Buffalo Riverworks. Again, Saturday, September 7th, I go on at 3 o'clock Eastern time. All right, folks, we're talking offense here on the other side of it. Be sure to stick with me. All right, folks, let's talk offense. Let's talk about Keon Coleman. I, I've obviously paid a lot of attention to Keon Coleman in the first two preseason games. Really want to kind of get a feel for where he's at, what he's being asked to do, and how he executes. And I, I thought there were some good things. The, the catch for 12 yards, him and Trubisky take advantage of a soft corner, get him the ball quickly, turn and run, get a first down. That was a good play. My favorite play that he made was the second play of the game. It was the quick pass to Khalil Shakir, kind of perimeter screen. And Coleman is one-on-one -on -one with Joey Porter Jr., who's a long physical corner. And he has to stock block him one-on-one -on -one in space. And he does a heck of a job, actually drives him off the field into the uh, the bench. It was a really good block. Uh, that was probably my favorite play. And I thought there were some chances. Uh, they had him going on some like corner routes down the field. But Trubisky was never going to pull the trigger on those throws um, where Keon was going to be able to kind of work the sideline and had some space. But, I mean, Trubisky is so risk averse. See, so risk averse that it, it um, kind of gets him in trouble um, because sometimes you ever try so hard not to make a mistake that you you can't help but make mistakes. I think that's just where, where the world that Trubisky lives in. And he's certainly not going to have the appetite to rip it along the sideline and trust the guy to go make a play. But I thought there were some chances for Keon to do that. Now, the big play that everyone's talking about coming out of this game is the red zone target. It's the third time that Keon's been targeted in the red zone. And uh, this has been a controversial play. I mean, a, a lot of Twitter and uh, discourse out there with a lot of wide ranging opinions and a lot of spirited opinions. And so I'll, I'll share my thoughts with you. I understand that it's okay to disagree folks. Like, if you listen to this podcast every single day or ever and just agree with everything that I say, that's, I mean, thank you, but you don't have to, right? Like we can respectfully disagree. It's, we're just talking about football, right? It's, this isn't, this isn't that serious. Um, so here's my interpretation of, of that play. Let's start off by being happy about him getting open, right? Like he, he was able to present an available target for a touchdown. So good release, got the inside leverage, had enough separation that he was av available on the play. Quick separation too. Like, great. And that's, that's awesome, right? That's what we want to see. That's the most important thing that you could look at from that rep. Now, from there, I do believe he should have made the catch. And I know that there's a lot of thoughts out there that it was a hospital ball and that he would have taken a big hit. I don't know. I mean, the, I, the all 22 angle that I have, that's from, the end zone in on the play, you know, kind of with the Steelers defense to the back, you can see that it's really not a tight window at all. And I, I'm not, I'm not sure that the contact would have been any different from that safety. If he did catch the ball compared to the, the bump that he got at the end there. But I, I, I mean, he should make the play. If he did make the play, I think he'd be widely celebrated. People would be going crazy. This is why the bills drafted this guy. Big physical receiver in the red zone, slot it in there, make a tough catch, hang on through some contact. People be going nuts. Be excited about it. But because he didn't, I think the justification comes in that, well, at least he didn't take the hit from the safety. I don't want him selling out to catch a pass from Mitch Trubisky in a preseason game. That's the spin zone. And, and to which I would say if he if he if he made the catch and took a hit, would you have criticized him or would you have been happy that he scored the touchdown? I think, of course, you would be happy that he made the play unless he was injured, and then you go right back to the spin zone, right? Bottom line is it's three failed red zone targets already this preseason. Talked all about the Bears ones last week. And, and my concern is that, like, 
Say what you want about Keon Coleman. He's going to make the team. He's going to have a role. But if he's not supposed to make the play, what are we even doing? Why are we playing in the preseason? Like, you're supposed to go earn your job. And, like, just don't be surprised if those opportunities go elsewhere to, to a Mac Collins. I think there's a there's a very reasonable position that we should be able to get to with this Keon Coleman play, right? He should have made the play, but I can live with him not making it because he had potentially avoided a big hit. Like I think I think I think you can live in both worlds. Yeah, it is preseason. Yeah, I get all that, but like I don't think there's really a switch like that where a football player should be like I I mean, I'm not going to catch this ball and that guy there's probably there's probably a good 5 yards of space between that safety and Keon when the ball's hitting his hands. So I don't, I'm surprised it's as controversial as it is, but I, I think it's unfortunate that we can't just talk about something and, and share different ideas about something and it not become like overly spirited. Let's, let's listen to each other and see what everyone has to say. That's my opinion. You can agree or disagree. We can move on with our lives. All right, let's talk about more offensive things. The offensive line cohesion was just so much better in this game, uh, particularly in the run game. The angles were good. The timing was good. The playing off each other was good. The way that the backs were reading the blocks, the way the blocks were getting to their spots on time, it was just so much better. And it, it validated a lot of my thoughts coming out of last week where, like I said, I don't think the Bills against the Bears were getting beat up up front. I just feel like it just felt like preseason game one. <laughs> And 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 for a lot of players, their first live game reps with each other, and you just kind of have to feel it out and get the timing down. And you could see how they built week over week, uh, particularly in the run game. And so it was good to see that. I want to highlight two offensive linemen in particular. We'll start with Ryan Vandemark, who I thought was terrific in particular in the run game. 13 snaps at left tackle, 21 at right tackle. His run game was awesome. Very athletic. I think everyone knows that about Vandemark, but it was how that athleticism translated into sustaining blocks, being under control, being leveraged into the ground, and controlling and 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 holding onto those blocks without committing a penalty, using good angles, using good timing, being able to reach block and showcase athleticism. I thought it was very very strong from Ryan Vandemark, particularly in the run game. I also want to call out Lyle Collins. Not that I want to overly celebrate here. But I can appreciate a couple of things about Lyle Collins. He's playing exclusively at guard, which I think is critical. Part of my concerns with watching Lyle Collins to this point has been, if you're going to ask this guy to play tackle, I just feel like the the athleticism has really been sucked out of him a bit, and he doesn't have much bend. And so playing him at guard where less athleticism is required is going to give him his, his better chance. And I've watched Lyle Collins for a long time, and I, I think he's adapted his game pretty well to being a more technical player. You know, he's not as explosive as he used to be, and so he's had to kind of overcome that with angles, with hand usage, and I feel like he's adjusted pretty well to be able to do that at guard. Now, as I watch this preseason play out, I'm left wondering if Will Clapp and Lyle Collins are competing for one spot. Because I just don't, like, you, you have the five starters, and then I think between Vandemark and Alec Anderson, those guys are safe as your sixth and seventh offensive lineman. And then Cedric Van Pran Granger and Tylen Grable as good-looking young offensive linemen. I think you want to keep them around. So if you keep 10 offensive linemen, I think there's one spot for Clip, Clapp or Collins. And if I think they both have been pretty good. I think Clapp's maybe been a little bit better, and Clapp offers flexibility to play guard and center where I think Lyle Collins might be a guard only at this point. You'd love to maybe have Collins back on the practice squad, but maybe there'll be a better opportunity out there for him. We'll see, but that's kind of how I'm approaching those two players right now. Next thing I want to talk about is running back pass blocking. This has been something that a lot of people in the subtext community have kind of asked me to pay attention to. And for the second week in a row, the Bills are not really asking their running backs to pass block. You know, this is a big storyline that I've, at least I've been talking about, where the Bills move on from Latavius Murray. He's been their best pass blocking back. You don't really love James Cook as a pass blocker. We'll see in terms of the rest of the guys. You know, Ty Johnson's 
a guy that doesn't have that many reps there. Ray Davis is a rookie. You know, do they have a pass blocking back? Well, they're not really asking backs to pass block. Only two total snaps of pass blocking uh, in this game. One for Ray Davis and one for Ty Johnson. And for Ray Davis, I thought in that particular rep, I thought he did a good job of identifying the linebacker that was coming. And then he he was squared up to the linebacker and the linebacker just kind of tripped before the, you know Ray could even execute a block. But kind of interesting that they're not really incorporating these backs as part of the blocking surface. We'll see. You know, I'm sure this is going to be game plan specific in, in the regular season. And I know that, you know, one thing that I listened to Sean McVay say recently, and I, I love listening to Sean McVay. I learned so many things from him when he talks football, but he's talking about eligible receivers and you only get five on any given play. And he talks about, you know, hey, do you really want to keep 20% of your eligible receivers in to, to block? And that's what you do when you use a, a running back. And so we'll see if the Bills kind of lean into that a little bit as well, but only two snaps where they asked a running back to pass block in the game. I do think the running backs played well. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk about them all. I think you can look at every single one, and I would say they played well. Two in particular that caught my eye, Ray Davis, first of all. Uh, his ability to make blocks right was really fun. Uh, very confident, decisive runner. His ability to string together moves and show good balance through that is impressive. And I think when you got that dense build like him, you're so low to the ground, and you're able to be quick with your ability to, like, like rapidly plant and drive. There's not a whole lot of gather, right? Because you're not tall and 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 you know high hipped or anything like that. He's really dense with low hips, and I think that allows him to plant and drive very effectively. And I mean, there was one rep that I, I shared it with uh, those folks in the subtext community. Again, there's a link in today's show notes if you want to join that. Where he's cutting, he's literally making a cut while a tackler is falling off of his legs on the safety. He kind of puts a little hezzy on him and breaks inside and, and makes him miss. I'm like, okay, buddy, that's fun. And so he's he's just a joy to watch. I love the contact balance that he has. Um, now I thought it was interesting that he ran, I think he ran eight the ball eight times. Seven times were gap runs. One was zone runs. And if you've listened to my commentary about Ray Davis, I've always kind of thought of him as a much better gap runner. And let's be honest, all run schemes in the NFL are blended. No team runs all gap or all zone. But the Bills tend to skew gap, and I think they'll skew gap even more heavily for Ray Davis when they get him on the field. And I thought Darrington Evans had a heck of a game. Um, he 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 didn't have as much space to work with as the other backs when he got a chance to run the ball, and I thought his ability to navigate those congested areas was really impressive. And then he's got big time speed. And so if he can get a little bit of a, if he can get a step, he can pull away because he's so explosive. And um, there was one play where the Bills are running inside zone to the right and everything was bottled up. And he he pushed the ball to the sideline and that edge defender had him leveraged. And Evans kind of gave him a hard outside jab, jab step and got that edge to kind of come up field and he just took off and just won the angle and got a big gain. So I think you know, Darrington Evans has kind of flashed to me a, quite a bit uh, with whether it's special teams reps in, in training camp practices that I was at seeing him cover punts, but also just an explosive nature to him when he touches the ball. I don't know that there's a roster spot for him, but as your RB4 that you'd love to get back on the practice squad, I think this is the most promise that I've seen out of Darrington Evans yet. And I've kind of followed him quite a bit here throughout his early career as he's bounced around. One other note here on offense before I do studs and duds, uh, only five snaps for Andy Isabella. And, I, you know, obviously, Trubisky plays, gets hurt. Danucci plays. He doesn't really have a whole lot of plays that he can run. So that probably impacts a lot of your wide receiver utilization, but only five snaps of offense for Andy Isabella in this game. As the Bills, what they do at wide receiver five and six is, or if there is a six, is really interesting to me especially with MVS and the injury. Don't, not really sure how long he's going to be out. Um, they've been tinkering around with some guys. Is Who's it going to be? I, I think I'm fascinated to find out. All right, my studs and duds. I always do this at the end of all, all 22 review episodes. I've got a long list of studs today. Um, and again, it's a little bit tough because preseason, you know, not everybody's playing a ton of snaps. Um, so I'm trying to be mindful of that. But my studs, Ray Davis, Darrington Evans, Ryan Vandemark, Greg Rousseau, Taron Johnson, Joe Andreessen, obviously, Daquan Hardy, Javon Solomon, and Sam Martin. I thought Sam Martin, for all the criticism he's faced lately, 
that dude left the ball high and deep time and time again in that game. I thought he had five really outstanding punts. So a long list of studs, and those are never in, in a particular order. I just write them down as I as I go through it. So don't pay any attention to the order. They're, they're all studs for a reason. My duds, I've got three of those for you. Mitch Trubisky, um, what, I mean, what can you say? Obviously, what, what did you want me to do? Sit here and rip the guy for the whole All-22 all twenty two review episode? Like, I could have done that. What's the point? He stinks. So pray to God Josh Allen doesn't get hurt. And we'll see what happens with Trubisky. I mean, he's got a knee injury of his own, and the Bills might have to figure something out when it comes to this quarterback depth. Uh, Kyron Brown, uh, he's he got cooked on that one vertical route, but as you watch like Daquan Hardy and Jamarcus Ingram, it's just very clear to me that they're ahead of Kyron Brown. And I talked about Kyron Brown kind of being the most meaningful competition that exists at corner for these young guys. And he is not threatening at all. And then Kendall Williamson, I think that guy just continues to be an adventure. He like has a couple of moments from time to time, but his technique is so sloppy. Um, and I thought it showed up once again against the Steelers. So your duds, Trubisky, Kyron Brown, and Kendall Williamson. All right, folks, there you have it. The All-22 review, Bill Steelers in the books. Hopefully you found this insightful. Hopefully you'll join the Lockdown Bill subtext community and attend the Rally on the River. Links to both of those in the show notes for today. Got a fun week prepared here. Uh, we'll get to herd mentality. I have a couple of guests lined up for this week as well. Uh, I want to get some outside perspective on some big topics. And then, of course, we got a preseason game to get ready for against Carolina. Final roster cuts. Before you know it, the Bills will be hosting the Arizona Cardinals in week one of the regular season. So stick with me, folks. Make sure that you're subscribed. would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills! And I look forward to catching up with you again real soon.